I am uh, very, very pleased to introduce uh, Matt Johnson. Uh, he has broad experience in psychoactive drugs, addiction, and risk behavior. His early contributions include research uh, contributing to the recognition of delayed discounting or the devaluation of future consequences and recognizing that's a fundamental process associated with addiction. Um, his research also validated methods and developed analytical techniques that have become widely used in discounting re research. We do that frequently here. Um, he's conducted a bunch of research in tobacco and nicotine throughout his career, determining the role of nicotine and non-pharmacological factors in tobacco use and addiction. Um, He's also been applying uh, behavioral economics to uh, risky sexual behavior, and he's conducted similar research implicating delayed discounting in condom use, as well as uh, the examining the effects of cocaine administration on those type of processes. He's recent, uh, more recently been involved with psychedelic research, administer of psychedelic substances, investigating the pharmacological and behavioral consequences of those um, activities, and he's the only person I know uh, that knows Tim Ferriss directly, <laughs> who's one of the investors uh, into their new Center for Research on Psychedelics. Uh, he's been interviewed on uh, many uh, media, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Um, he's also the president of the Division of Psychopharmacology and Substance Use of the American Psychological Association. Uh, when I was, I was Impressed with Matt uh, when we were talking about him joining the lab as a graduate student. He was already published at that point, and he's continued to be a prolific uh, contributor to the scientific literature. And I couldn't be more pleased for him to present us some research on behavioral economics and tobacco and nicotine. Thank you. Thanks, Warren, and uh, it's it's a true honor to present for you all. And I'm going to be showing you a bunch of stuff that. Um, uh, uh, lines of research that I owe completely to Warren for in indoctrinating me in uh, so many years ago in, in graduate school. So it's a particular um, honor to present for this this group. So let's see here. I'll start off with this. I always think it's funny. The uh, this is the part of the talk or the the paper where you have to t like tell a scientific audience that like smoking is bad for you. I think that's always, it's, you know, it's mandatory, so you got to do it. So just one novel twist on that that I want to just focus on. You know, we focus so much, and we've learned so much about, you know, the cancer risk, lung and other cancers, uh, the heart disease, you know, and these are, don't get me wrong, not to be underestimated. Well, we stopped talking about some of those factors that even before all that, what folks in the 1950s talked about. What did they say? It's, it's going to stunt your growth. <laughs> Right? Like, you know, that just dropped off the radar. So, you know, I don't want to forget about that. So this little guy here is a reminder. So it might look like a toddler smoking a cigarette. This is actually a 43-year-old assistant manager at Chipotle on his, uh, on his lunch break. So there might, we need to reinvest in some of that research. There's something onto this uh, stunning your growth thing. Well, anyway, smoking cigarettes, to quote, um, Mr. Mackey from South Park, you know, smoking is bad. Okay, we all get that. I'm talking to an educated audience. So getting a little more serious here. Um, so in the backdrop, and a, a backdrop is, and I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, to a number of you who are conducting research with, with Warren and are certainly familiar, others that are familiar with his research, but I'm gonna be presenting work using this um, uh, demand uh, framework within behavioral economics and so just to kind of um, this was literally what I was indoctrinated in with with Warren for my dissertation so one of the really cool things that I think is not like really driven home enough and so many of the fo folks that are, are taking on this type of framework and analyses the the real power is sort of decoupling these different aspects of reinforcement. So demand curves really challenge this notion that reinforcement is, on, is a unidimensional construct. So the traditional term relative reinforcing efficacy you know, should really be questioned because um, it, with so many questions, it's like, well, which is the better reinforcer? The answer kind of is it depends 
uh, on, on which measure of reinforcement you're talking about. And so the cool thing is that different uh, sort of more traditional measures of reinforcement seem to correspond to different aspects of the behavioral economic demand curve. And for those uh, you know, not familiar, I am showing you uh, sort of a, a typical demand curve, and this is from a study that Warren and I ran um, looking at both money and cigarette puffs in a three-hour um, operant opportunity to earn, to pull plungers to earn uh, one of these two reinforcers. And so on the x-axis, you have increasing price, in this case in, in the form of work requirements, how many uh, knob pulls you have to conduct to earn a reinforcer. And then you have the number of reinforcer earned, or consumption, if you will, on the y-axis. So as the price uh, escalates, people typically start out at some preferred level of consumption, and then they typically hold on to that until the curve becomes more elastic, um, more price sensitive at some point where they're unable to defend their consumption, and then consumption starts to drop off. But in terms of the traditional measures, the, the cool, cool aspect, well, first of all, I'll just say there's a corresponding response output curve if you look at the same data and, and graph on the Y rather than consumption or reinforcers earned. If you look at the, the price that's actually paid, the, the, the response emitted to earn that reinforcer, you have an analogous uh, figure with where there's an escalation and, and price paid until you get to that shift from inelastic to elastic responding and then the curve flips over. Um, but then in that correspondence between traditional and demand curve measures, it's been found that choice uh, procedures where you can, um, procedures where you have the option to uh, select one reinforcer or the other, tend to correspond to the relative heights of, 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 of demand at a particular price when these demand curves are run separately. So that's Pre, you know, predictive of which is going to be selected in a choice situation when they're concurrently available. And then uh, the, the Omax or the, the maximal output that's emitted at the Pmax price um, uh, on, on the demand curve or the output curve, that corresponds to, in terms of traditional measures, peak response rate that you might get in a, a free operant uh, response situation and then the, the, uh, another traditional measure is breakpoint in a progressive ratio schedule where the work requirement increases um, with each successive reinforcer earned. And that tends to correspond to the point on the demand curve where consumption is finally brought to zero. And uh, so you can do a whole lot with that, that framework. So this is some early work that Warren and I conducted with um, uh, consumption of, of, of different commodities in the laboratory, like I just showed you, but here looking at, at, at cigarettes and in, including uh, nicotine gum, and I'll just show you, forgetting the, the money condition in that study now, but the, um, these are conditions under which here, the, these are uh, ci the earning of cigarettes when the price escalates, when cigarettes are the only um, uh, commodity available. And then this is a concurrent session where uh, same thing for cigarettes. During these sessions, the price increases across these different sessions, or the number of knob pulls required increases. But then throughout all those different sessions, there are concurrently available um, uh, fixed price opportunities to earn the opportunity to chew nicotine gum for a minute in each reinforcing bout. And so the interesting thing you see here is that even though the price of the nicotine gum was available at a, a low price, Low price throughout, it was 10 plunger pulls, um, you saw uh, a, a, an increase in its consumption, and that's solely due to not its own manipulation of its own price, but due to the change in price in the, in the other reinforcer, cigarettes. So basically, as cigarettes get more expensive, it's harder to defend the amount of, that you would prefer under an ideal circumstance when they're very, very cheap. So your, your consumption of this alternative increases, and that's one definition of a behavioral economic substitute, do you get a positive slope for this type of fixed price alternative? And then some, some more work that we conducted, um, in this case, uh, examining uh, denicotinized cigarettes. In this one panel, you see um, full nicotine-containing cigarettes alone. And then this next case, you see data similar to stuff I just showed you in the previous study where you had 
um, cigarettes available at increasing prices, but then you have nicotine gum available as an alternative. And so you see that positive slope again, where gum is substituting. And then you see, um, in this case, uh, nicotine, uh, 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 denicotinized cigarettes taking the place of the gum as the alternative um, with, again, price escalating cigarettes. And you see, just like nicotine gum, that the denicotinized cigarettes um, functioned as a substitute with that increasing slope. So that's interesting. You'll see, you know, both the thing that shares a similar pharmacology, the same active drug, nicotine here, serving as a substitute. But then you see this, this um, alternative which lacks the nicotine um, but it is of the same, it's a similar operant, you know, the, the taste and the feel of smoking is a thing that's similar. But along these different dimensions, you see that they're both functioning as a substitute. And then we looked at conditions under which, um, similar scenario, but now you have both the gum and the denicotinized cigarettes as, um, as alternatives. And you can see here that the stronger uh, substitute in terms of a stronger positive slope was actually the denicotinized cigarettes, which is interesting um, because it wasn't the nicotine driving the day. It was the thing that, you know, looked and felt like smoking. And uh, looking at those data another way, I'd argue another uh, definition you can apply to substitution is not just the slope, that so-called cross-price el um, elasticity or the slope of the fixed price alternative, but you can look at the, act the ability of the presence of those alternatives to potentially decrease the consumption of the price manipulated reinforcer. So here I'm just showing you the consumption across the different prices for, um, for the, the for full strength, the, the regular nicotine containing cigarettes, so when they're alone and when they're available with all of the substitutes. And you see that in all cases, the presence of those, uh, sub, those alternatives decrease the consumption of cigarettes. Um, and interestingly, you know, you, you saw somewhat of a decrease with nicotine gum, but you really saw the most decrease uh, when denicotinized cigarettes were available, whether that was with or without the gum. So again, kind of uh, with this factor, this type of analysis suggesting that um, perhaps ironically that the, the, it wasn't the pharmacology that was driving the day. Um, the denicotinized cigarettes were the more powerful substitute for smoking. And so then more recently, here's a paper published a couple of years ago applying the same uh, framework. Uh, this time, instead of using laboratory operant uh, procedures, these are using hypothetical purchasing tasks. So this is looking at the interactions of, of, um, of, of cigarettes, uh, e-cigarettes, and nicotine gum. So these were, this was conducted on Amazon Turk with 350 uh, dual users, people that, that um, both used regular cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And we only looked at nicotine gum in the subset of people who actually had some real world experience um, on uh, in using nicotine gum. And so kind of the, we saw found some subtle differences, but I, I think by and large, when each item was available individually, you know, e-cigarettes versus regular cigarettes, the, the, the biggest max message is they looked remarkably similar. Um, and we looked at uh, puffs, because that's kind of a way that you can't really compare number of cigarettes to like e-cigarettes are different because you just have a large number of puffs on any particular e-cigarette, especially if they're refillable. So you, you got to look at something like number of puffs to kind of equate these things. And so you just see remarkably similar demand curves with similar intensity of demand or how much they're, they're, they're puffing when available at a very cheap price and then also elasticity sensitivity to price. Um, so more struck by the similarities than differences. Here are those uh, conditions where the regular cigarettes are available at an increasing price, but then e-cigarettes are available as a, a fixed price substitute. And I should say in, in, the, in this study, all of the prices I'm talking about now are monetary. A price is not plunger pools. And so you see that um, uh, relatively shallow, but that positive slope of the e-cigarettes, even though they were available at a cheap price throughout, you saw that as it was harder and harder to obtain the pricier and pricier um, regular cigarette puffs that people were adopting um, e-cigarette puffs as a substitute. And then similar data on, on subset, subset of people who used nicotine, had experience with nicotine gum, a very positive um, uh, slope with uh, nicotine gum serving as that substitute. Now, interestingly, in comparing those, I'll, I'll jump back to the 
the, um, the e-cigarette data, you actually saw a, strong, a more positive slope with the nicotine gum than you see here with the relatively shallow positive slope of e-cigarettes. I think it, one of the limitations of just looking at this cross-price elasticity or the slope of this fixed price function um, as a definition of substitution is that you can have cases like this where nicotine gum by the slope alone looks like the more powerful substitute, stronger um, positive slope. But in fact, I would argue uh, that uh, e-cigarettes look like the more powerful substitute in a sense because the only reason that slope is so shallow is because even when both were very cheap, regular cigarettes and e-cigarettes, e-cigarettes were such a good reinforcer that people were consuming at high levels even then. So, you know, in a way that it's stronger as a reinforcer than, for example, had it started out very low um, and gone up in the case of nicotine gum. Then another way of looking at that, again, like some of the older work here, I'm just showing you all of the data on regular cigarettes and how that consumption of, of regular um, uh, cigarettes is, is affected by the, avail the concurrent availability of either e-cigarettes or gum. And, and you can see here that the virtually, there was virtually no change and perhaps even a hint of an, of an increased consumption when nicotine, not, probably not reliable, but basically the same consumption when nicotine gum was available, but you see a substantial decrease, including at, um, this would be sort of at the, the most realistic um, equivalent of the market value of cigarettes. You saw a pretty sizable reduction in um, the, the, the reported consumption of regular cigarette puffs when e-cigarettes were available. So again, kind of by this type of metric, suggesting that e-cigarettes were the um, more powerful substitute, especially again, when looking at that difference that uh, roughly approximate the, the actual, if you calculate how much cigarette puffs are costing in the marketplace. So now I'll shift gears a little bit and move into a discussion of nicotine reduction policy. So, gosh, it's now been decades ago that Benowitz and Henningfield had this radical idea of, 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 of reducing nicotine content in commercial cigarettes as a way to decrease smoking rates. And in 2009, that potential became a reality with the, the Family um, uh, Tobacco Act that was signed into law. And um, it, that act does not allow the complete reduction of nicotine, but it, it says they have the ability to manipulate nicotine to some non-zero level, which to a scientist is essentially equivalent to bringing it to zero, because you could bring it to some you know, you could theoretically bring it to a millionth of the regular levels, which will essentially be zero. So I just told you this. And so there's some, been some interesting work to date with reduced nicotine cigarettes. I'm suggesting they can help um, cessation and reduce toxicant exposure. So some studies suggesting that um, some reduced uh, nic that it reduces nicotine exposure, that's, that would be expected, um, reduced carcinogen exposure, uh, reduced c craving and dependence over time, and reduced uh, reductions in um, cigarette consumption um, and increased rates of quitting. One interesting thing that behavioral economics, I think, is really poised to address is this idea that there could be potential for compensation. So there's some um, evidence, um, trends that weren't necessarily sig statistically significant suggesting you might get this compensation. So in other words, if you reduce the, um, the, the percentage of nicotine in the cigarettes, will people then smoke more cigarette uh, puffs or you know, inhale them more deeply or uh, you know, consume uh, cigarettes uh, to a greater degree in some way, shape, or form in an effort to compensate sort of like if you reduce the alcohol content in beer and you just drank more you know, beer to make up for that. So in this case, unlike the, the alcohol example, this is actually really critical because we have the, the unique situation where the, the, the psychopharmacological drug, the, the primary reinforcer, nicotine, um, is actually not the most dangerous aspect. It pales in comparison to the the carbon monoxide and the aromatic hydrocarbons that are actually causing cancer and heart disease. So it's the smoking of the tobacco and everything that comes with burning tobacco, not necessarily not the nicotine 
that's the true harmful thing. So if you actually reduce nicotine, you get people smoking more to maintain the same level of nicotine, this would be a really poor public health um, outcome. So we don't want that. So, um, so some unanswered questions that we need more research on. Do we see compensation with behavioral economic demand analysis? Um, does prolonged uh, exposure affect that compensation using demand analysis? In other words, whatever you get on like sort of a single exposure to reduce nicotine cigarettes, that doesn't necessarily speak to um, what you get after they have had uh, constant contact with that reinforcer. There might be some extinction processes that are, that are brought to bear um, when someone really has long-term use of that reduced nicotine pro uh, product. Another question, does prolonged exposure to reduce nicotine cigarettes change um, uh, cigarette uh, demand? So hopefully we see a reduction um, uh, in demand um, that would be predictive of reducing overall amounts of smoking in the marketplace, which would save potentially millions of lives. That's the hope. And then do uh, reduce nicotine cigarettes uh, substitute for full um, nicotine cigarettes. So this is going to be, I mean, this if there is a, a, a mandated policy, you might argue this is a moot point. Um, if you got, if you removed all the, the, the full nicotine cigarettes from the market, but the situation is complex because if the regulation isn't smart, you might still have full nicotine um, cigarillos, mini cigars that are still in the marketplace. And unfortunately, those are several instances where those, the regulation on those is different. So you can see these, you know, them uh, operating as, as an alternative to watch out for in the marketplace. So people might you know, switch to this other um, uh, you know, product. Or um, as we've been uh, chatting about over the la today and yesterday, you know, there's the potential for a black market effect because despite your best intentions, there might still be um, full nicotine cigarettes out there, even if they're, you know, shipped over illicitly from China, for example, and available um, illicitly. So an important question is to what degree reduced nicotine cigarettes substitute for full nicotine cigarettes. However, that full nicotine product might show up in the, in the real marketplace. So in terms of methods. We use these uh, spectrum cigarettes, which a number of you are uh, very familiar with. We, we examined um, a, a full uh, range of doses, including the 14.8 uh, milligrams per gram uh, strength of, of cigarettes. This models what close to what you typically see for a full strength cigarette in the market. Um, and then uh, three different levels of reduced nicotine cigarettes. And we use these um, different shapes and colors to just refer to them as the like the yellow circle brand or the blue square brand, and we we blinded I think that's on the the next slide or one of the next slides, but we blinded the 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 not just we had a double blind on what dose they were getting, but we actually did our best to obscure even the idea that we are uh, that we are manipulating nicotine itself. Which is interesting. That's becoming more and more difficult to do because there's this thing called, you know, clinicaltrials.gov where you have to lay out your experimental design. So it's it's you know very difficult to do some of this kind of uh, stuff that's kind of traditionally been done in, for example, social psychology where you're kind of hiding the nature of the thing you're studying, trying to control for demand characteristics. And so you can get creative though while not telling a fib. You can just lay out a broad number of conditions on clinical trials. Dot gov. So looking at variations and a, a number of factors of cigarettes and nicotine falls on that list. Unfortunately for this, you know, in making this point, there are some subtle differences in the composition of these, of these cigarettes. So you can truthfully lay out a number of factors could, that vary between these different cigarette products. So some, some interesting, more and more, you know, there's interesting scenarios like this where you know, conducting good experimental re research in, in, the, in the face of modern regulation presents some interesting challenges that you have to be creative to work around. So this is an example of our um, Lindsley plunger operant box, the same type of equipment that uh, was used in that older work I did with Warren in graduate school. Um, so these were, we had them, these custom made by our hardware and software guru um, Len O, and uh, they work quite well. We have a 
people smoke through a cigarette holder, which I'm showing here. So there's a um, there's the differential in pressure as people um, through these two tubes when people inhale um, a lit cigarette uh, through the holder, and through that you can get the entire range of uh, outcomes on t puff topography. And so, unlike a lot of commercial, the, one of the reasons we custom built equipment, and I'm showing you the video here of someone inhaling the through the cigarette through the holder, and they have a real time feedback on the volume we're shooting for a volume of of 70 um, cc's or milliliters and when they when they get up to 60 that kind of accounts for the reaction time that it takes to kind of okay i got to stop inhaling now to get them close to 70. Um, and so a, a lot of the, the the commercial equipment out there will really just look at t puff topography as an outcome that should vary you know just looking at naturalistic um, differences and you know do you inhale deeper on this type of product for that that type of product for example here we want it to kind of flip that around and and target a particular aspect of topography we want people to inhale a, a specific volume of cigarette to treat that as an operant reinforcer and so this equipment is very good and we correspond it quite a, a a bit with Jeff Stein from your your group to um, help us to uh, uh, develop the parameters for um, engineering this this current system. So thanks for that. And moving on to the rest of the of the session methods. So like I didn't go into these details earlier, but like for that older work that I conducted with Warren, folks had to come in with over six hours of of abstinence from smoking cigarettes. Um, and what that functionally meant in terms of something that's actually verifiable, they, they had to get a carbon monoxide reading that was um, no more than 50% of their baseline reading. So carbon monoxide is a reliable indicator of recent um, smoking. Um, these were three-hour sessions, one session per day. And they typically had in this study three sessions per week, although that could vary. The operant reinforcer was about of three of those 70 milliliter puffs on the cigarettes, and the prices that we examined, or the fixed ratio values, were 10, uh, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. So this is, what this means is that at, at FR10, you have to pull this knob 10 times, and then the computer initiates this bout. You saw a bit of that, um, of prompting the person to take three inhalations on that cigarette. And they had to lit, light it themselves, and we have monitoring to make sure there's no cheating. Um, so they had to light it a little bit without really inhaling too much and then insert it into the holder. And as I, I described before, the nicotine content was blind and they were obscured to the fact that we were even manipulating it. Um, and they received a, 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 they were, everyone received, so the experimental design gets a little complex, they, everyone received a, the full strength nic nicotine cigarettes in the lab and, and and everyone received conditions under which that full strength cigarette was compared to one of the reduced um, nicotine level cigarettes. And so that was all within subject. But then which of those three various levels of nicotine reduction, that, was, that differed across subjects. So some people was the full versus the full 4.8 uh, dose of reduced nicotine. Some it was the full versus the um, whatever it was, 1.8, the, the three different levels of nicotine. So that varied across participants. This is our current sample as of about a week ago. Um, we've got 37 people that have made it through the protocol, Several, so it's ongoing, uh, I should say. Um, there, 69% uh, uh, of the folks are male, shooting for half and half, but doing the best we can um, for a gender split. Uh, the uh, me mean age, 45 years, um, mean cigarettes per day is 15. So these aren't lightweights. These are real deal smokers. And the Fagerstam score of, of nicotine or cigarette dependence is five. So that's a, a fairly high number suggesting, um, yeah, they're, they have some good nicotine dependence going on. So in terms of addressing that first question, do we see compensation with behavioral economic uh, demand analysis? So here I'm su I've superimposed demand curves for on, on each graph for the full nicotine versus each of the different reduced nicotine levels um, in each of these panels. So these, again, that's 
the reduced nicotine level differ, differs across participants, so that's why these are different ends in these different um, categories. Um, and so these are conditions under which there's only one cigarette type available, so these aren't concurrent sessions yet, but I'm, I've just put them on the same uh, figures for comparison. So you can see, um, I think the big story that really shakes out here is, you know, if there was compensation, you would see the, the yellow um, data points or the reduced nicotine consumption data points being higher, and yeah, no evidence for that. Um, by and large. So thankfully, it doesn't look like we're seeing compensation. So I should say this is the point in the, in the experiment where there hasn't been prolonged exposure. This is sort of across several sessions where they haven't had this three-week exposure that I'll tell you about where they're actually smoking at home. The instructions are only um, one of these experimental um, levels of nicotine cigarettes. So this is before we have that prolonged exposure manipulation. But right now, in this sort of pre- um, exposure assessment. We're not seeing um, any evidence of compensation. We're seeing nice orderly demand curves, which um, tells us we're doing things right. And then we have that three-week um, break um, in the experimental laboratory operant sessions during which we supply these cigarettes and they, they smoke only the experimental cigarettes. Um, after this three-week break, they repeat um, the identical laboratory um, sessions again to see if there's any shift in the answers we get. And then during these new laboratory sessions, they continue to smoke the experimental cigarettes outside of the session. So I should say these are what you would call an open economy in the sense that as long as they go, if they conduct a session, as long as they go six hours without smoking before their next lab session, you know, they leave session and they, they smoke as they, as they normally do. And now on those pre-exposure sessions that I've already shown you the data for. Um, those would be their, whatever their normal cigarettes they smoke. Now we're getting into this phase after this three weeks of exposure where they're sent home with one of these levels of, of nicotine in the experimental cigarettes. They're continuing to, to use those as the ones they smoke at home in between the ongoing operant sessions in this post-exposure phase. And so he, answering the question here, does prolonged exposure affect compensation using demand analysis. So fortunately, um, the answer is still no. It wasn't like the answer differed after this, this three weeks of exposure. I think there's you know, kind of just one data point maybe in a father's eye that you might say, well, maybe there's some compensation there. In the overall scheme of thing, that's probably noise um, with the overall pattern um, suggesting that there's not uh, compensation um, you may have noticed we've shifted from three panels in the pre-phase to four panels uh, in the post-phase. This really gets into the weeds of the experimental de design, but with the, with the full, the, the, the people that would eventually be exposed to the full nicotine dose as their take-home dose, in these laboratory sessions, we thought the most interesting thing for them would actually to be it's normally full nicotine cigarettes versus one of the one, one of the experimental their take their eventual take home dose. That's the comparison. For those people, it would have been the same reinforcer, and maybe that would have been an interesting condition there as well, the 14 versus the 14. But we actually wanted to have a comparison of those people too, so we assigned those people in their laboratory sessions uh, to compare the full dose to one of the reduced nicotine. Uh, cigarette levels, even though it wasn't going to be what they were exposed to in the exposure session. For those, we picked the most promising dose from the Donnie et al. Um, work that had been done with these reduced nicotine cigarettes, um, uh, the 2.2 uh, level. Uh, but once there was then exposure to the, t so that's what one of the groups was N of 17, large into the other group that was really combining these two experimental groups before the exposure period those were functionally the same, which is now we have four panels rather than three because now these groups do differ because they have different in what they were exposed to. I realize I probably lost you in some of those experimental details. If you didn't get it, don't worry. It doesn't affect the, you really don't need to really get that. It's really into the weeds of our experimental uh, design with this combined within subject and between subject design we have. Um, so now moving on to the next question, does prolonged exposure to reduce nicotine cigarettes change um, cigarette demand, and so, so here on each panel, I'm comparing the pre-exposure to post-exposure um, operant sessions. 
uh, for each of the, uh, the cigarette types. So we have, you know, a lot of panels going on here. We have the different, um, uh, up top, the different uh, uh, nicotine, the different take-home uh, doses, which are on our upper panel, our upper line and our descriptors here. And then we have the, um, uh, which, you know, so that's, those are the randomized uh, dish, uh, conditions they're assigned to, what would their take home a cigarette dose be? And then on the next line, I have listed the two, um, the, the types of cigarettes that are being compared in terms of their pre versus post consumption level. And so the big story here is that there does seem to be some hint, and we'll see where the data go with this ongoing study, if anything, um, a reduction in some conditions uh, for, um, uh, for the yellow uh, data points to be below the blue points. In other words, in the post-exposure phase, people are smoking less in these, um, in these uh, operant sessions, which is encouraging. That's suggestive of this idea that there may be a, a reduction in overall consumption of cigarettes because of prolonged exposure to, to um, reduced uh, nicotine. The only problem is, um, the, the fly in the ointment is, we see some evidence of even exposure to the full strength um, cigarettes that there is that reduction. So it, this may not be, and again, studies ongoing, so we'll see where this goes, this may not be, in fact, a product of nicotine uh, reduction. It may be the experience of basically having to smoke a, a, a less preferred cigarette. So we're going to be carefully looking at, at that as an alternative hypothesis um, going forward. Next question, do reduced uh, nicotine cigarettes substitute for full uh, nicotine uh, cigarettes? And um, here, at, to orient you towards the, what's shown in the curves, the blue points will refer to the, the demand curve for um, full nicotine cigarettes when they are the only uh, reinforcer available. And then I'm showing you in the yellow points the, the consumption of the full uh, nicotine cigarettes when there is the reduced nicotine alternative available. So you'll notice that where there is a difference in these first two uh, uh, level uh, nic reduced nicotine conditions, that there's a pretty uh, substantial reduction. So the, pre the presence of that alternative reduced the, the um, consumption of full strength, full nicotine cigarettes. And then the red is the consumption of reduced nicotine cigarettes when they were available at a, at a fixed price. And I should say we did this, um, I'm showing you here the, um, the, the post data, but we in fact did these cross price elasticity concurrent sessions both in the pre phase and the post phase. And just to briefly tell you, doesn't appear to be any difference there. So I'm just showing you um, one of those phases here. So what we see is, um, compared to when cigarette, full strength cigarettes are alone, in those concurrent sessions, you get a reduction in consumption of those um, full strength cigarettes. And you see this positive cross price elasticity, this positive increasing slope for the fixed price alternatives. And this is the, the low fixed price for these reduced nicotine cigarettes is an FR10, so 10 pole, so a cheap price. Um, so yeah, that's suggesting that as you know, the price for the full nicotine cigarettes gets pricey. It gets too rich for your blood. Um, you can't, you can no longer to defend your pre preferred consumption level at these lower prices. Your consumption then starts to drop off and you go to the less preferred alternative and the reduced nicotine cigarettes and that increases. So it does appear price dependent that these reduced nicotine uh, cigarettes can serve as substitutes, which really tells us in a regulated market, we really need to be mindful about the price at which these um, products are available. So I just threw this, this in to show you that, um, you know, this was instructional control. We said, please don't smoke your um, regular cigarettes during the exposure phase and the post phase. Um, if you do cheat, you know, we tried our best at the end to um, have them fess up. And essentially we, we um, got, um, and this is similar to the work that Eric Donnie and colleagues have shown using these cigarettes and we kind of modeled this three-week exposure period after some work they did with a six-week 
exposure period. They actually found that any changes in cigarette consumption during that time kind of stabilized out at three weeks, so we thought we didn't need the full six weeks. But um, we got the same kind of response here in terms of how much, um, you know, they were close to you know, around 80% um, uh, that the cigarettes they smoked were, in fact, the study cigarettes. But there was some amount of cheating, so that's a caveat to certainly be aware of. So it's ongoing, but some preliminary conclusions. We, we do see similar or reduced consumption of reduced nicotine cigarettes compared to uh, full cigarettes, so certainly no evidence of compensation, which would be bad. So this is good. Even if they were the identical and not no reduction, that would still be a good thing um, in terms of immediate consumption. Prolonged exposure to reduced nicotine cigarettes does not generally result um, in compensation. Just said that. Prolonged exposure to reduced nicotine cigarettes decreases demand for full or reduced um, uh, nicotine cigarettes. We're seeing that in, in some conditions. The big caveat, again, is it, you know, this is, appears to be true for the full cigarette exposure uh, people. So it may or may not be uh, due to nicotine reduction. Uh, reduced nicotine cigarettes substitute for full uh, nicotine cigarettes. That's good. Um, so their availability decreases consumption of full nicotine cigarettes and appears to be true so far for at least two of those lower, um, of, the, of the higher reduced nicotine doses. And it's not quite so clear if it's at the lowest uh, dose yet. So um, data perhaps to be brought to bear in terms of what should be the reduced nicotine um, uh, level if this is a regulatory policy. And consumption of fixed price reduced uh, nicotine cigarettes uh, increases when the price of full uh, nicotine cigarettes increases. So that's the cross price elasticity component. And so here I got uh, five more minutes or so. I'll show you quickly um, some data that we've collected on this potential for black market cigarettes. We think if they uh, re mandate that all cigarettes that are legally sold have this you know, reduced or potentially trivial nicotine level, you might see, I think you surely will see some level of increase in black market of cigarettes. Um, so these are data collected on an Amazon Mechanical Turk um, survey system. Uh, these were 590 people that contributed to the data set I'll show you. They were adults, smoked at least five cigarettes per day. These were different conditions where, and this was the hypothetical type task since it was an internet survey. So we're asking people how many cigarettes would they buy, we asked how many packs they would, would buy. Um, uh, I think this was over a week long period for um, using uh, uh, when each of these different types of cigarettes were the only thing that was available. So comparing own brand, reduced nicotine, uh, the r regular brand of cigarettes, that's what I mean by own brand, what they normally smoke now, and then reduced nicotine uh, cigarettes or black market cigarettes. And we had a little vignette describing each of those. And the um, thing I'm really struck by there is like, you know, remarkably similar demand curves if these were the only things that were available. And then we uh, tested this idea where, where the, the black and market cigarettes were framed as a potential alternative where there was, there was a price escalation for reduced nicotine cigarettes. So this is modeling if that's what's available in the legal marketplace. And so the black dots I'm showing you, um, again, these were shown on the, the last slide, but this is when those are the only thing available in isolation. And then the open circles are the level of reduced um, nicotine cigarette consumption when those black market cigarettes are available as an alternative at a low price. So you see some level of reduction um, in the, the legally available reduced nicotine cigarettes. And then you, in, the, in the triangles, you see the, um, the black market cigarettes. So this is interesting. We have, we have more to figure out here. I was expecting, uh, of course, these to function more as a substitute to see um, an increase in consumption of black market cigarettes as the price of the legally available reduced, nic uh, reduced nicotine cigarettes increased. Um, so if anything, we got a hint of a, uh, of a complementary relationship. This is the opposite of, of, of a uh, substitute relationship with a decreased slope. So we have some stuff to figure out there. I think a, a, a big picture point here is that 
just the, cons the fact that we're getting some substantial levels of, of, of some consumption of, of uh, uh, on average of these black market cigarettes is concerning um, across all of the prices of reduced nicotine cigarettes. So in the big picture, I think that's just, that's an important demonstration that we should be concerned about whether they're, they're showing a positive cross price elasticity or not. And let's see here, I'm showing you a, another condition in which we, um, again, I'm showing you reduced nicotine um, uh, cigarettes here. This is not when they're available alone. This is in this, uh, this condition in which there are three alternatives available. One, the reduced nicotine cigarettes um, at increasing prices, but then there were two fixed price alternatives. So this is like that older work with um, nicotine gum um, and, and uh, denicotinized cigarettes as substitutes at, 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 a, at a fixed price for full nicotine cigarettes. And so, um, again, you're seeing a slight decreased yeah, slope, so it's suggestive of a complement for both um, these two alternatives, which are the black market cigarettes again and um, vapor pods. So these are dual vapor pods. And so we kind of think a, 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 a critical thing to look at is if you have a reduced nicotine policy is um, in balance with the a potential black market is the availability of hopefully what will be a well-regulated and safer, not safe, e-cigarette product um, that doesn't cause some, some of the you know, harms that we're seeing news about these days. So interestingly, yeah, both of those products look to, they hang on and they're consumed um, uh, when they're available at fixed prices. You know, again, some, something to figure out about that, that slightly negative slope. But in the big picture, you know, those, those are both consumed in the marketplace when reduced nicotine cigarettes are, are the uh, legal combustible cigarette alternative. And um, vapor pods, and in here I should say we went for what we thought, we took a guess, but we, on the black market, like what black market cigarettes would be available for, probably gonna be more expensive than cigarettes at the store. We kind of went with 12 bucks. Um, it would probably be higher in New York, for example, but like for around here, I don't know what cigarettes go for like seven, eight dollars. So we kind of went for something uh, higher that it would look like on the black market. And we went for um, the roughly the current market value of jewel pods. So um, it's good to see that actually as a substitute that these e-cigarette jewel pods were actually consumed at a higher level um, as a substitute than the black market cigarettes. So we think regulate smart regulation of, of, of a legal alternative such as e-cigarettes would be critical in dealing with this um, black market issue. And finally, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you um, with a linear axis so you can more readily discern some of the difference. Um, I'm showing you uh, reduce uh, nicotine um, cigarette demand across these different conditions when those are the only thing um, that are available, reduce nicotine alone, and when they're available with only the black market um, cigarettes as an alternative, or when they're available with the black market and the e-cigarettes as alternatives, and you see the greatest decreases when um, when the uh, when the e-cigarettes are available above and beyond uh, you know the black market cigarettes alone. Again, pointing to the idea that it might be important to have well-regulated e-cigarettes um, if we can have a safer product in the marketplace. Um, so important issues for potential reduced. Nicotine policy, what about the black market? We uh, think there needs to be a lot more work about this critical question, so it's really exciting that, that Warren and folks here um, are also onto this question about black market effects. Um, and the integration, the smart re uh, regulation of e-cigarettes is gonna be critical if we go into this um, reduced nicotine regulatory policy. So what that means, what smart means is not over-regulating e-cigarettes, so this, this, you know, abuse liability is also another way to say um, uh, effective substitute. So, you know, we have to balance the idea of, like, we want to minimize the attraction of, of adolescents, particularly, to adopting, you know, e-cigarettes, um, particularly those portion of individuals who maybe would not 
have become a combustible cigarette smoker. There's probably some kids that would have become a combustible cigarette smoker, but they're using e-cigarettes instead of, that's probably in a regulated e-cigarette market where they're safer anyway, that would, that would be a, 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 a good thing, a lesser of two evils, but there's gonna be some kids that are using e-cigarettes who never would have smoked regular cigarettes, so that's a bad thing. So we wanna minimize how attractive this product is, but we don't wanna do that too much if we're gonna really leverage them to minimize the number of people dying from combustible cigarettes. Um, and so another part of that, that uh, what would constitute smart regulation is not taxing e-cigarettes too much, you know? And so you gotta think about the kids. And we know taxes have a super proportional effect on minimizing adoption of smoking by kids. So that's, it's, this is gonna be a tough equation to figure out, you know, stronger effect of price of taxes on minimizing consumption by adolescents than you get for adults. But at the same time, if we overtax e-cigarettes, you know, they're not going to be effective substitutes if we could, you know, pr prevent millions of deaths um, that we see every year from um, cigarette smoke, or about a half million a year that in this country associated with regular combustible cigarette smoking. So a uh, large number of acknowledgments took a whole lot of folks to contribute to a, a lot of this work that I showed you today, but that is it, and thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, very interesting. So, with those demand curves with different doses of nicotine, what happens if you convert the cost to unit price? Right. So you got different uh, amounts of nicotine. Right? So, it, it, to, defined by nicotine per, yeah, level. Response cost, right? We have not done that yet with these data, but we have uh, uh, done that with a hypothetical data set and it's uh, cur currently under review. We've actually been shopping this paper around. <laughs> it, it didn't stick the first uh, couple places we, we sent it to, but we addressed that kind of question with um, different levels of nicotine reduction hypothetically and conceptualize that as the unit price. In other words, how much you have to puff, and you sort of puffs taking the place of monetary price um, in order to obtain a fixed amount of nicotine. Um, and so we did see, in, in, in at least with those data, um, what you would expect for a, a, a demand curve. So it seemed to conform to, you know, um, there was a preferred consumption level which dropped off. Um, yeah, we, we actually saw a, a little bit of a deviation from that, I think, at, at, the, at the beginning where there was an, there was an, an, an increase in demand. And I think that's because we were starting with doses that were so high we wanted to go beyond what they normally get to an extreme level in both directions and i think we were starting with essentially what was um you have to eat an entire pizza we're starting with a dose of nicotine that was like so high so we saw a little bit of an exception to the law of demand at those at, at one initial price but then it looked just like a regular um demand curve but but yeah um will be you know that that'll be a very fascinating analysis you know, with these um, current dat, uh, operant data to look at that. Do you know whether it's hard in your in lab data set that it's still being collected with the larger online samples? I mean, look at whether things like age or smoking severity or anything, or maybe some sort of moderating disease effects, or the effects of the ability to consider it stronger. We did find that higher um, Fagerstrom nicotine dependence or cigarette dependence scores were associated with, in, in some of the data I showed you, greater propensity to consume black market cigarettes. And so that's one, one thing. And, and, and higher demand, just straight up demand for, for um, the various products when they were available alone. So yeah, and, and we did find, maybe not surprisingly, that just like kind of a, a face valid question of, uh, you know, if you know, this reduced nicotine policy was out there, would you be willing to go to the black market for any cigarettes? And so we found that that was not surprisingly related to d uh, demand levels for black market cigarettes in the framework I showed you. I think you, you were first, but then you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Right. For like so when you fight the chin, the person you select to be the income also will be affected. Some one very high income, definitely will I don't care. Right. So if a low income will be okay, I really need to think about that more more or more like Right, yeah, right. That's my understanding. I don't know think about that or Right, right. I think you're exactly right. Um and so in our laboratory data, it's, it's kind of weird because uh, plunger pools is, is the price. And so in effect, everyone is sort of equated on their income level because the income level is essentially how much time in that session. So sort of the, that, that three hour session is kind of the limit on their income. Um, and maybe their, their, their tolerance for kind of pulling on this effortful knob, you know, is you could conceptualize as part of their income, their resources that they have available to, to spend on, on these products. Um, but yeah, in the, in the marketplace, it's going to be, um, like it's, it, it very much, you know, seems that, you know, monetary income level is going to have a very real uh, effect. And that's probably the driver for, I, I mentioned before that we, we know well that taxes have a super proportional effect on consumption levels in teens, which is great because that's where you really want to reduce because you get a teen smoking and, a, and they're going to be following those patterns for, for decades. So that's probably one of multiple reasons why that's, that's a strong effect in teens more so than adults because, hey, raising the price of cigarettes by a dollar is a big deal to a 14-year-old that's getting a little allowance or mowing lawns or whatever, swiping a dollar here or there from their mom's purse or something, but it's not, not such a, as big of a deal for a person, you know, with a full-time job. And then obviously the higher income is even less of a, a of an issue. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. We, um, in some of our online stuff, we haven't, I don't think we've looked at income effects, but that would be a, um, we have those data and I might be forgetting, we may have looked at it, um, but we could go, uh, that's an interesting question. I wouldn't be surprised if there's, if there's something there. If like the, and so you would expect the, the effect on elasticity, in other words, how quickly that curve is brought, price affects the curve. Um, not necessarily on intensity, which is kind of where they start out when they're essentially free, but that, um, you know, that the cigarettes would be more inelastic or they defend that preferred consumption if they, you know, made a lot of money. Um, but great point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that the spectrums could just be less preferred overall, regardless of nicotine concentration. And the fact that your black market enter the people who have never been exposed to the spectrum themselves, do you think that that impacted the data? Yeah. Yeah. And so we did our best to just um, to have them. Uh, so at least with the with the with the e-cigarette. Uh, data I, I, I showed you as, as part of that study we also got this that was actually one in the same study that we actually also a, uh, asked about different levels of reduced nicotine consumption so I mentioned that's the work we're trying to get published now for that study I had this limitation in mind when I at least required our e-cigarette users to have had experience with different nicotine levels so it's something it's not with regular cigarettes but at least with some nicotine product you kind of know what it's like to get the, you know, the, the 24 versus the 20 milligram level of nicotine. And so, yeah, that's a huge, like, noise factor that folks really don't know what explicitly different nicotine doses are out there. Which, um, so if we get anything of order out of those data, it's, it's cool. But it's obviously critical to then do something like the laboratory work uh, to get, you know, more realistic answers. Well, uh, everyone, please uh, help me thank Matt for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you.